Today we come to the third part in the uh, message of the living God. Uh, we looked at uh, Old Testament references, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 5, uh, 1 Samuel 17, uh, the voice of the living God, Deuteronomy chapter 5, on Mount Sinai, and then we looked at the victory uh, through the living God uh, in David, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, when and Goliath came out with a challenge to the Israelites, of course, they uh, were fearful. Uh, but when David heard the uh, defiance of Goliath, he could say, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who defied the armies of the living God? And then we looked at Daniel, Daniel chapter 6. Uh, we looked at serving the living God. Uh, and then we looked at, we went into the New Testament, uh, John chapter 6, uh, Peter's confession, uh, the Lord Jesus asked the question of his disciples, will you also go away? Uh, or you also won't go away, will you? Uh, is the literal translation of that expression in John chapter 6. And then uh, Peter gets it right and says, Lord, whom shall, whom shall we go? And thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so there we saw testifying to the living God. And now when we come to uh, two more references, uh, First Timothy chapter 6 and First Thessalonians chapter 1. Uh, we come to trust in the living God and serve in the living God. Let's just pray first. Father, give thanks for your word. Thank you for the fact that you are the living God. Uh, we thank you that you are self-existent. Uh, we thank you that you alone are the source of life and all life really derives from you, whether that be physical life or spiritual life. Uh, so far, we give thanks now and just pray for your help as we turn to these passages, pray as we are challenged by your word that you are speaking to our lives, and we pray that you will help us to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ uh, in a practical way in our lives day by day. So Father, we ask for your help as we acknowledge how much we need you as we give thanks in the Saviour's name. Amen. So first reference is 1 Timothy chapter 6. <clears throat> and we're going to break in at verse 9, First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and the snare, into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after, they have erred from the faith, <clears throat> and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. For thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. <coughs> fight the good fight of faith, and they hold an eternal life, whereunto thou hast called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate's witness, a good confession. And thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable until, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in times, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only have immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honour and power <coughs> everlasting. Amen. And here's our verse, charge them, that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but <coughs> in the living God, which gives us richly all things to enjoy. That they do good, they be rich in good works, ready to dis distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation. Against the time to come, they may lay hold of eternal life. Uh, and that will... Uh, be a start uh, to the first of two readings uh, there in the New Testament. And so here as we, uh, Timothy ends, uh, sorry, Paul ends his letter to First Timothy, uh, we see the theme of money and riches. And of course it uh, really goes back to uh, the verses we read, the uh, temptation of riches in verse 9, they that be rich will fall into temptation and a snare. And then the love of money is the root of all evil. And then there's coveting. <coughs> and then we see that <coughs> even there are some believers that have erred from the faith and passed them through from many sorrows. But 
uh, the contrast here is between what had happened to some believers, no doubt some of the false teachers as well. Uh, but Timothy was the man of God, verse 11. He's to flee these things, literally run uh, from these things, and then pursue uh, these characteristics. Uh, righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Uh, but then when we come down to verse 17, uh, the final charge uh, is to those who are rich in this world. And some have defined that expression uh, as those that have more than they need. Uh, and if uh, you have food, clothes, and a roof over your head, uh, you're probably in this category. Uh, but the specific instruction is that they would not trust in the uncertainty of riches, uh, but in the living God, which gives us richly all things to enjoy. And so, as believers, we must use our resources and our riches responsibly if we want to be rich in the age to come. Notice. Uh, verse 19, uh, laying up in this store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come. That is to use uh, our resources and our riches for the Lord's work uh, and uh, for the Lord's things and to use them wisely uh, that they might be a good foundation against the time to come. And part of the challenge uh, of uh, riches uh, is avoiding being proud. Uh, and this is the constant danger with riches, is that uh, it makes humans proud and uh, looks down on others. Another part is our tendency to trust in riches instead of the living God. And this is the aspect we want to pick out uh, from verse 17. Trust in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. So uh, you notice the contrast in the language. Don't trust in uncertain riches, but in God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. And so it's an acknowledgement uh, that all uh, riches and resources that we have are really His, and that they come from the living God who actually gives to us all we need for our enjoyment. Uh, and I think that word enjoyment is the same word for pleasure. Pleasures for sin for a season, Hebrews chapter 11. So there it's in a negative sense. But here let's remember that God has given us everything to enjoy, his creation, our resources, uh, the fellowship of believers and many other things, both spiritual and material, are actually given for our enjoyment uh, of our life. Uh, and this is achieved by trusting the living God, uh, by doing what verse 18 says, do good, be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Uh, some translations have it like this, they should be rich in good works, generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. Uh, and this uh, is how we can avoid the proud and trust in, in uncertain riches, but in living God. Uh, it's by a willingness to be a giver and doing good with our resources. And so the simple question is, are we laying up for ourselves a good foundation? Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. of the Macedonian church or churches I should say in Corinthians chapter 8 uh, and verse 2 uh, how that in great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and the deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality and our translation says they are being tested by many troubles they are very poor yet they also are filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. I wonder if that uh, description could be written over me or over every uh, believer in Christ. And so uh, riches and resources really test us when we're trusting in the living God or we're trusting in the uncertainty uh, of riches. And there are many, many examples. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the one that springs to mind is the rich young ruler, uh, Mark chapter 10. Uh, and uh, he really wanted to know how eternal life when the Lord Jesus said go uh, sell to the poor uh, and you will have treasure in heaven uh, he wasn't prepared to do that because he had great possessions uh, and then of course the Lord explained that it's hard for those that have riches to enter into the kingdom of heaven then First Thessalonians chapter 1 is our other reference First Thessalonians chapter 1 <clears throat> and we'll read from verse uh, 5 
for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sound out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God will spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show us what manner of entering we had to you, how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And again, know that God will bless the reading of his words. And of course, when the Thessalonians received the word of God from Paul, uh, they responded to it by leaving their idols, it says in verse 9, uh, and giving them to themselves to serve the living and true God. And so the title for this passage is Serving the Living God. And then the word for serve is Julio, Greek word, which means to be a slave, which means to be completely yielded uh, to. Uh, and this is a word that's used uh, throughout the New Testament. Matthew chapter 6, uh, verse 24, Lord Jesus used this word on the Son of the Mount, No man can serve two masters, uh, for either will love the one and hate the other. Uh, and <clears throat> that's the same word that's used there in Matthew 6. Then Romans chapter 12, verse 11, uh, Be not slow for in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Same word as serve here in First Thessalonians uh, chapter 1. Then in Acts chapter 20, Paul, when he spoke to the Ephesian elders at Miletus, uh, speaking of his own life, said, Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and tears. Acts chapter 20 and verse 19. Then Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, uh, speaks about uh, liberty uh, and says by love we should serve uh, one another. Same word again as here in First Thessalonians. And then in Philippians chapter 2, Paul said of Timothy, he served with me in the gospel. And so we see this is a quite a, a unique word, a word that's used quite extensively throughout the New Testament and on a number of occasions and contexts. Uh, but I was thinking, what does it mean to really serve God? And I just picked out a few things from the lives of the Thessalonians and what's in the letter uh, to really challenge us as to whether we really are serving God. The first thing was the example of their lives, verse 6 and 7. Uh, they became followers of us, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and of the Lord, and received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. So the first thing was the example of their lives. Uh, they were actually in samples in their own locality and then further afield. Uh, and that's because how they received the word and the joy they experienced of the Holy Spirit. Then verse 8, their commitment to the gospel. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God would, it's faith to God would have spread abroad so that we need not to speak <coughs> anything. And that is the gospel spread out uh, from Thessalonica, and the ripple uh, went as far as Macedonia and Achaia, and every place, uh, the testimony of the Thessalonians. So it was the commitment to the gospel as well. And then, uh, verse 10, the anticipation of the Lord's return, and to wait for his Son from heaven. So they lived expecting the Lord Jesus to return. They lived uh, expectant lives, waiting for the Lord Jesus to come back. And that enabled them to serve God, anticipating he would come back at any time. And then chapter 2, verse 13, their reception of the word of God. Uh, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as is in truth, the word of God which effectually it worketh also in you that believe. And so Paul, Silas and Timothy actually were able to give thanks for how the Thessalonians received the word of God. And there are other things as well, but I picked out those four things to just give us a, a more clearer picture of what uh, is involved in serving the living and true God. Uh, being examples in our lives, uh, commitment to the gospel, living lives, uh, anticipating the Lord's return, and then fourthly, reception of the word of God. 
let's just pray. Father, give thanks for these two passages that we've looked at in the New Testament on the challenge of these verses. We pray uh, you'll help us, Lord, to use our resources and our riches uh, in a, a way that lays up for ourselves a good foundation in time to come. You pray it help us to be uh, generous, to share with those in need, uh, and Lord, to use uh, what you've given us uh, for your glory and for uh, the eternal kingdom. Thank you also, Lord, that you've called us to serve uh, the living and true God. And we pray that our lives will be examples. Uh, we pray for Christ-like lives as we live our lives for you. We pray for commitment to the gospel. <clears throat> we pray for a good reception to the word of God. And we pray for uh, lives that live in anticipation of the Lord's return. So, Father, thank you for this time together. Pray you take all the truths of these passages and speak into our lives. Help us become more like the Lord Jesus, we pray in the Saviour's name. Amen.